Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, unique device secrets in Calyptra with uh, how to build those with a puff. My name is Ben Tals. I'm CEO and founder of Intrinsic ID. And in fact, I'm um, replacing our CTO, Geert Jan, who could not be here today. So I'm uh, going to tell the story to you. So, um, yeah, probably all know about Calyptra. Calyptra is a specification of a root of trust for data center chips. Uh, it has a hardware part, RTL block if you want, with a CPU, with crypto cores, SRAM, TRNG, whatnot. And it also, of course, has some uh, software layer on top of that that contains functions for attestation, identity, measurement, authentication. Yeah, and these are kind of the things I will be speaking about today. There is an open source implementation available. And um, we'll focus in on the security part of it, uh, in particular the root of trust for measurement, yeah, which of course attests that to the chip's integrity of the configuration, the mutable code, and then in particular the root of trust for identity, yeah, uh, uh, where of course these device unique secrets come in. Yeah? And how do you create those and uh, how do you make sure they're secure? So here is a high-level picture of the Calypta, Calyptra architecture with several blocks, yeah, the CPU, ROM, SRAM, and whatnot. And you see there below there is this uh, Axi bus. Yeah, and on the Axi bus there are several components, yeah, a TRNG, yeah, PLLs, uh, and also uh, a PUF. Yeah? And so the unique device uh, uh, secret yeah, is uh, what forms the root of uh, the, the, the secret root, if you want, for Calyptra. So, and the Calyptra specification recommends using a puff for this yeah, to protect the, unice, uh, the uh, unique device secret, yeah, or we would even say to generate the unique device secret, as you can do that too, yeah, and uh, at the same time it will be protected, so you have uh, two birds with one stone, if you want. So there you see uh, that puff component. So what is a puff, or a physical unclonable function? By the way, not a physically unclonable function, but a physical unclonable function. That's a slight, uh, uh, slightly different thing. But the best way to think about this is that it is the biometric of a chip. Yeah, so chips are physically unique, and we'll explain it a little bit more, just by the deep submicron uh, process variations. Yeah, and so you can extract that uniqueness, and you can even extract that in a very elegant way. And if you, of course, extract that uniqueness, and you can do that reliably, then you have your uh, uh, um, unique device secret, or you have another key with which you can encrypt a unique device secret. So, um, silicon process variations. Yeah, you always have those for every chip that is being made. If, if you look at the wafer coming out of the fab, all the dyes, all the chips on the wafer, they're logically equivalent, meaning that if you give them the same electrical inputs, you get the same electrical outputs. But if you look uh, uh, inside the chip, you will see that from a physics point of view, the particle distribution, the doping distribution, the line witness, as you can see, yeah, is slightly different chip by chip, even transistor by transistor. And that probably you all know because uh, tra all transistors have a unique threshold voltage. So these things you have, uh, of course, silicon manufacturers try to get those away as much as possible because otherwise uh, you, you could have problems with, with the functionality of your chip, but you, there is always some left. Yeah, and that introduces this uniqueness. And uh, there is the so-called law of Pelgrom. Yeah, uh, um, he was a semiconductor physicist saying that these variations, the sigma, are proportional to the inverse of uh, the node size you're working in. So the smaller the node, the more process variations that you have. So the more, let's say, pronounced the uniqueness of the chips really is. Yeah? So already from this, you see that there is potential here yeah, to create 
yeah, that uh, unique device secret or to create a unique key to uh, protect a unique device secret. So are there uh, uh, several puffs? Well, yes, I mean, we, we have been working uh, uh, for a long time on several different uh, instantiations. Yeah, there is, in fact, two classes, uh, those with a dedicated circuitry and those based on a standard component. Yeah, and uh, those on a dedicated uh, circuitry, you see a whole bunch from a ring oscillator puff, an arbiter puff, a quantum tunneling puff, a via puff, bus giver puff, OTP puff, butterfly puff. Uh, they, they have all been investigated up to a certain extent, and uh, most of them uh, have the disadvantage that yeah, you have to rebuild them for every process, for every node, for every fab, to make sure that they have enough entropy, as we say, enough randomness, enough uniqueness, yeah, and that they're sufficiently stable. But then there is one particularly interested one, interesting one, and that is the one based on a standard component, namely the one based on the behavior of SRAM. Yeah, so, and that's the one that you see at your right, yeah, the so-called SRAM puff. Yeah, which uh, uh, is based on the behavior of uh, SRAM in particular, its uh, startup behavior. And the nice thing is, every digital chip has SRAM. Yeah, whatever chip you're building, data center chip, AI chip, HPC chip, microcontroller, microprocessor, there is SRAM. In every FAP, in every node, in every process, there is automatically SRAM. If there is no SRAM, there is no node. So SRAM is like ubiquitous in semiconductors. Yeah? And that makes it really nice because it, make, it means that it's very easy yeah, to work with this component. It's well understood. Nobody is hesitating to use SRAM. So uh, A, it's a standard component yeah, available everywhere. We talked about that. It has very well-known properties. Yeah? Um, it's extensively studied. It's peer-reviewed key extraction algorithms yeah, that we had developed uh, for those. And we published a paper, by the way, already in 2007 about how to do that at the CHESS conference, the Cryptographic Hardware and Embedded Security Conference, the main conference in hardware security. That conference celebrated its 25th anniversary a few weeks ago, and that paper on the key extraction from SRAM was one of the top three papers at that conference. So uh, it has really been very well studied by the peer community, as you have to do that, of course, in crypto. So another nice thing is uh, if you say, well, 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 this is all a very nice story, but I would like to feel and see it, yeah, then it's very easy to do. You take a chip, there is SRAM, you measure the data, you send the data to Intrinsic ID, and we will tell you how the thing is behaving. Of course, you can look at it yourself also. If you have enough insight in how this thing works, yeah, then you can do it yourself. And it's proven, yeah. It's currently in more than 600 million instead of 500 million, 600 million deployments in the, fields, in the field. And it has a very, very good entropy source. There's lots of entropy in it. Yeah, and you can even leverage that also to build a TRNG. Yeah, so you have two birds also there with one stone. Yeah, so this is the um, brief explanation of the SRAM puff. Yeah, so we start at uh, the graphic number one. Yeah, all transistors due to the deep microprocessor variations have a unique threshold voltage. Using the threshold voltage directly is difficult. Yeah, going to measure those and threshold voltages are susceptible to temperatures. So what you do is you look at a phenomenon on the chip, which behavior is dependent on the difference of threshold voltages. Yeah, and that is in this graphic number two, yeah, where you see a, a very um, a rudimentary representation of an SRAM, two cross-coupled inverters. When the power comes up, the SRAM cell chooses its logical preference state, either logical one or logical zero, which depends on the difference between the threshold voltages in the inverters. Yeah? And the difference is important because now, when temperature changes, yeah, the, threshold volt the difference between the threshold voltages will stay the same. So, what you can see is if you look at those, uh, at those values right after startup in an SRAM, they're completely unique, meaning if you look at the values in an SRAM line next to it, half of the data is different. That's what you want. But if you power down an SRAM, you power it up again, and you compare the two measurements, then you will see that a few bits might have flipped. Not many, a few. So, and therefore, you need to apply some error correction, which we have developed 
to make sure it's stable always in Alaska, in Phoenix, in 25 years from now, always the same unique key on that device. Yeah, and you have to do some key extraction to make sure it's fully random, not random at the casino level, crypto random. Yeah, so really random, random. Yeah, and that's why you do key extractors. Somebody who tells you we don't need a key extractor, he is not going for really random, random. He's doing something else, but not really random because no natural source always produces perfect random numbers. That's why these key extraction algorithms have been developed. So looking at the SRAM path, you get a device unique and clonable key that you can use for the crypto purposes. So what's the advantage? Well, you can see that in this graph, on the vertical axis is security, on the horizontal axis is um, cost, if you want. Yeah, you see different types of memories, anti-fuses, flash, uh, um, fuses, ROM, and all these pictures are, are made with some type of microscope. Yeah, so you can see that there is data in the memories. Yeah, and that means an attacker can find it. So if you store, I don't know whether you all realize that, but if you store your keys in the memory, the keys are in the clear. Some people will say, no, no, we don't do that. Okay, so what do you do? We encrypt it. Where is that encryption key? Well, it turns out either they put it also in the memory, which means it's in the clear, or they put it in the RTL, which is even worse because then on all your devices the key is the same. Yeah, but the point is that the key is visible in the memory, and if a hacker knows it is there, he will find it. Don't worry about it, he will find it. So the nice thing about the SRAM puff is that the keys are not there, because if there is no power on the SRAM, there is nothing, there is no data in the SRAM, and SRAM is a standard component which keeps also the cost very well under control. Yeah, so, um, well, how do you do that? There is always two phases if you work at a puff. The first phase is called enrollment. The second phase, and it's typically one time. And the second phase is called key reconstruction, which is, of course, many times, every time you need, you need your key in the field. So during enrollment, what you do is you measure the SRAM and you create what we call helper data. These helper data help to recreate the key, always the same key. Uh, also in the field, yeah? And that has to be stored somewhere. Nice thing is, these helper data are non-sensitive. You can print them on the internet, you can give them away to every hacker, it does they do not give any information about the secret key. In the field, every time you need a key, you measure the SRAM puff, you use the helper data, and you come up with the final secret. Yeah, so in at Intrinsic ID, we have developed a set of products, but these are the main flagship products that allow you to implement that. There is a RTL block called Quidigy that you can implement for chip designers. There is a, a software at the right called Zyn, which works even on existing chips. It runs on any CPU. Yeah, uh, and then there is one specifically for Xilinx FPGAs based on the so-called uh, Butterfly Puff, a product called Apollo because on most of the Zynx FPGAs, there is no available SRAM. So this Quidiki block, by the way, is the first security IP block that achieved PSA level three for the root of trust. It's also still the only one, yeah? So it has been well tested, well evaluated, yeah, for security purposes. But it, uh, it gives you uh, these uh, device unique keys it has key wrapping, it has a true random number generator inside, uh, and also very nice is it's pure digital logic, it's a single clock domain, yeah, and it has a secure key output, making sure that the keys that come out of it can be uh, uh, securely being input into uh, encryption engines. And it's proven resilient when you're more than 600 million devices, yeah, in all kinds of um, applications, so, it withstands temperatures from minus 55 to plus 150. Voltage swings plus minus 20%. It works for more than 25 years. Yeah, and it withstands radiation. You can even find those SRAM puffs in space. So just some example here. Yeah, a temperature graph. Why these SRAM puffs are robust. 
Yeah, on the vertical axis, you see the noise level, the horizontal axis, you see different temperatures, and the different colors represent the different devices. Yeah? And then you see that the noise level on the vertical axis is always below, I have to see in this graph, let's say 11%. 11% is something you can very well correct with, with the error correction codes. Our error correction codes correct up to 25%. Yeah, and here you see even a bit more, yeah, for more nodes. Yeah, the previous slide was for 65 nanometers. This one is for several nodes, even five nanometers and so on. You see again that the uh, noise level uh, uh, stays sufficiently low, uh, like 17, 18%. When you can correct up to 25%, that's clearly not a problem. And this is very nice. Yeah, so there is an aging countermeasure, yeah? We sometimes call it the L'Oreal for SRAM. You know this L'Oreal that you can cream that you can put on your face to look younger. Yeah, by applying this technique of writing the inverse values into the RAM, you burn in the original erroneous values, which means that the noise becomes less over time. Yeah, and you see that very nice in that graph on the, on the right. Once the measure has been applied, the noise is going down, and you see that the slope is negative, which means it only becomes better over time, and that's why we can have this uh, uh, guarantee that uh, uh, of the 25 years. And here you see also that it's completely unique. Yeah, you see the histogram is centered around uh, 50%. So um, if you use it in Calyptra, yeah, you get a number of benefits. A, it's a strong entropy source for your unique device secret. Yeah? Either you can use it to encrypt the unique device secret, or you create the unique device secret itself immediately. You don't have to store any sensitive data in the NVM, because you can always encrypt it with this uh, secret. It's, it supports flexible provisioning, yeah? and it is compliant with NIST SP8 890. And finally, it is reliable, it's proven, yeah, with 600 million devices in the field. Yeah, and as I said, it is the first one to have been PSA uh, certified level three. So um, if you're going to implement Calyptra and you want a good protection for your device, unique device secret, please reach out to us so that we can collaborate yeah, on making sure that that unique device secret is properly protected. Yeah, and that maybe we can also help you with a random number generation and help you also with how to uh, protect your supply chain uh, or even to set up sip, uh, uh, good uh, security for your chiplets, yeah, as we have worked out some um, architectures for that, yeah, which we uh, have been working on also now with uh, a number of customers. Okay, thank you. I hope uh, you learned something about the SRAM Puff and happy to answer any questions. Still not, there we go. Uh, the anti-aging that you mentioned, uh, is that a one-time thing that's done or does that have to be done occasionally through the life? Yeah, so um, we, we, so we implemented every time you would create a key with, with Quiddiki, that would be applied, yeah. Just to guarantee that it keeps on working. I think that's all the time we had for, but thank you very much. Okay, thank you.